Welcome to our Global Sermon. What a privilege and an honour for me to share with you today. We're doing this across all our churches around the world. Today I want to share something from the depth of my heart. And so I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Whether it's your Bible or your Bible app, let's read it together. Let's honour God's Word. Shall we stand? And let's begin to read God's Word. Can you read it with me wherever you are? Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Shall we pray? Father, we just thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we pray as we gather across the world together, Lord, as we listen to this sermon, Father, I pray may your Holy Spirit speak to us. May your Holy Spirit cause your words to come alive in our hearts. May your Holy Spirit anoint our ears to hear what you want to say to us. Father, I pray may your words lodge deeply in our hearts and cause it, Lord, to bring a deep transformation in our lives. So, Father, we just commit each and every one of us unto you right now. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, would you like to see your life group grow? Would you like to see your church grow? Would you like to see the kingdom of God grow? It would be truly amazing when we can see all of this happening. When we look back into the book of Acts, in the time of the early church, we see that they grew very quickly. How did this happen? How did they manage the growth in this church that's growing so rapidly? I believe one of the keys lies in the group gatherings which the early church used. And so in my sermon today, I'm going to share about groups that grow the kingdom. Can you say this after me? Groups that grow the kingdom. Well, as you may remember, in our Vision 2030, we're talking about transforming lives everywhere. And we're believing God, our faith goal is to see 100,000 disciples of Jesus Christ and to see churches in 3,000 locations. Now, that is a huge goal. But I believe it can be done. We can reach that goal if we do it God's way. Now, last year, we shared about the importance of mentoring. Mentoring is how we help each believer, Christ follower, that they may grow quicker, that they may grow in a more effective way, a more well-rounded way, a more wholesome, balanced way. And not only that, but also to multiply themselves. And so the key is always this, when we build in quality, the quantity will eventually come if we will be faithful to the things of God. This year, we want to focus on another key pillar, our small groups. You see, when we have small, healthy groups and it multiplies, it also will grow the kingdom of God in such a powerful way. So I want to unpack this passage for us to show us the importance of small groups in the life of our church. And to help us understand the context of this passage, we must appreciate the context of the temple in Jerusalem. So let's dive in. Well, firstly, the temple was built on what is known as the Temple Mount. It's a hill, a hill in the old city of Jerusalem. Originally, King Solomon built the first temple. But it was destroyed by the new Babylonian Empire. And then the second, a more basic temple was built by the exile that returned. And that happened during the time of the governor, Zerubbabel. And then much later, 
King Herod came along and he expanded upon this temple and he truly made it into a much more magnificent, it was splendid place that he was able to build during that time. Let me explain uh, what it looked like. And I have a picture here that you can see. And so this, this new place, it had huge retaining walls that King Herod built up around the hill. And he actually raised that top part of the hill with these retaining walls and he filled it all up and he created a large plateau. It's like almost a, a, a platform at the top of the hill and the, with the temple right in the middle of this thing. And this wall temple ground measured around 37 acres, something equivalent to about 20 soccer fields. And in the temple areas, there are different temple courts for different groups of people. And, and around those walls in the inside are beautiful covered areas, commonly known as the colonnades. And there are different parts of them. And Solomon's colonnade, which we will hear about and you will read about, is right in front of the entrance to the inner parts of the temple itself. Now the temple grounds is so large that actually several hundreds of thousands of people can fit in that area easily. And Josephus, who was an ancient Jewish historian, he recorded that this place can handle up to 2.7 million people in any one day in the midst of all their festivals. And so the key thing to understand is this. Every day, there would be several thousand people in the temple grounds moving in and out. Uh, and there will be all kinds of activities happening around the place. Just imagine in the morning and evening during the times of the sacrifices it's, and, and all this preparation for the sacrifices are just happening non-stop every day, every day. Money changes are uh, used by the travelers that come from afar. They're merchants, they, they're selling animals for the sacrifices. They are food stalls and so forth. And this is essentially the setting where Jesus came in. And that's why Jesus got so upset and he, he overturned the tables. He, he pushed away the merchants. That was the context that Jesus found himself with all this activity around the place. Not only that, then inside the, the grounds, there often will be priests and others who will be seeking to teach different groups of people, teaching them uh, religious things and, and other things. And that is the reason why Jesus, when he was teaching in the temple grounds, it, it was not unusual. And, and often within the grounds too, many different groups would gather and be, and be doing different things. Uh, it could be business, it could be prayer, it could be something else that was happening. And so the, the reason why it was happening there so much is because this was a very popular, a very convenient place to gather people. Imagine that it was like a huge shopping mall in those days. So now, let me share my observations on this passage. I want to talk about five key elements that made this small group so effective in growing the kingdom of God. Now, the first key we notice is this, that there were strategic group gatherings. When we look at the scriptures in verse 46, it says here, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, I want to point out to you, notice that there were two types. There were two types of gatherings in the early church. The difference was not in their meeting locations, but in the nature of the gatherings. Why is this so? Well, think about this. When we break bread, when we have communion, that is a major part of our Christian worship. And we see here it happened in the home gathering, but not the temple gathering. So really, the home gatherings were the house church. They were the live group gatherings where there's worship and prayer, there's communion, there's the teaching of the word, there's fellowship, and all these different elements that are happening. And really, our life groups in our churches is based around that same 
concept, which is why the, it's so important that we help the people get into smaller groups, not just in the big worship services. And in the sermon, I will explain more why this is so important. But what about the temple gatherings? The answer lies in the context of the temple. I've explained to you a little bit about the, the temple and how it looked and, and what happens in there. Well, it will be very difficult to hold a large worship service in there. Don't forget the early church already had thousands of believers. There will be noise and distractions happening everywhere. Thousands of people every day wandering around. So not so good for any significant large worship service. But the temple courts were strategic for outreach. Think about that. Because almost anyone and everyone would be in the temple grounds at one point or another. The, the temple grounds was the gathering place for everybody and, and every Jew at one point or another had to go to the temple courts. And just, just imagine they could have held many smaller, smaller meetings at different locations within the temple grounds on different times of the day. Uh, some could be held even simultaneously. So it was really not the best place for worship service, but really good for outreach. They could easily have groups, maybe up to about 100 people in, in some quieter spots around the place. And if you had a speaker who was teaching or preaching, he could raise his voice above all these background distractions. And, you know, in such situations, you have a bit of distraction here and there. It's, it's okay. They can handle those things. So it was there in those settings in the temple grounds where often they will be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will be teaching about Jesus and all the things he did. And there was the place as well that many of the signs and the wonders, the miraculous were occurring. And so people were healed. Therefore, when people got healed, people just got attracted to it. And it was an easy place for people to gather. Passerbys, onlookers can, can get sucked in as, as they observe what has been happening when they, they preach the gospel, when they talk about Jesus, when, when people were healed. No wonder many people were getting safe every day. Wow. When we look in the scriptures, we find there are two categories of gatherings, of groups that's happening. You have what we would call life groups, and they had the outreach groups. So we need both as well. Now the second insight we can see is that it was led by the right type of leadership. When we look at verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So the early church, they, they rallied around their apostles because they recognized that they had been appointed by God. And see, for any venture, to grow and to develop, there has to be leadership. Without leadership, it'll lack direction, it'll lack momentum. But when they are the right type of leaders, that area of that ministry will just grow and grow and, and begin to flourish. So, but the thing is important is to understand is we need God-appointed leadership. Leaders who align with the heart and, and the mind of God. Leaders who will lead their groups into the purposes of God. That is important. So when we have home groups or life groups, we need spiritual leaders. Leaders whose key role is to nurture the people in the ways of God, to nurture them spiritually. And, and that's why life groups is such a crucial part of all our churches. Really, it helps to nurture communities of faith within the church. And so life groups, they form the backbone of our churches. And so the strength of our church lies so much in the strength of our life groups. Think about that. That is why every one of you, every one of you, I want to encourage you, you should be a part of these life groups. I want to encourage you to invest, to contribute into the life of those life groups. Help it become healthy. Help it grow and even multiply. And, and that's why I want to encourage us, all our church membership, you should consider rising up eventually to even take some leadership roles in some of these life groups. Now, some of you might say, but uh, I don't think I'm qualified. 
and maybe I, I don't have the right knowledge, the right skills and, and, and so forth. But can I say this? Knowledge can be learned, skills can be acquired, can be, can be taught and trained. But what's most important is your heart. Are you available to God? If you're available to God, all the rest will eventually fall into place. So I want to encourage you to consider, would you be willing to, to walk that journey, to begin to take some leadership role, especially in the life groups? Now the outreach, those ground-breaking groups, they too need leaders, but leaders who are creative and evangelistic, leaders who are eager to reach out to people, people who have a better understanding of how to connect with non-believers. That is so important. How to uh, walk with them, how to connect with them, and, and also perhaps to encourage and lead others to do likewise. What we need are those kind of leaders. Leaders who are willing to adapt themselves so that they can be, have a greater impact evangelistically. Uh, we, leaders who are willing to experiment to see what can we do in this outreach group? What, what, what activities and so forth can we do? I'm going to have Pastor Dennis right now to share with us how one of their groups did something that made a difference. Shalom everyone. I'm Darren from Hop Kota Samarahan. I'm representing Pastor Dennis to share our testimony. Praise God that this year we are breaking new ground in IPG campus, which is a teacher institution to train the student to be a future primary school teacher. We have been praying for many years for this new ground, and finally we are able to outreach to them. One of our members have friends inside and linked us to the Christian Fellowship President inside this college, and this is our person of peace. We need to go through several processes to deal with college authority. They required us to prepare formal letter for any activities to invite the student to join our fellowship and friendship gathering. To cut the story short, after a few amendments to the formal letter, finally the letter was approved by the college director and our church was given permission to do activities inside the college and invite the student to join any outside activities as well. We really thank God for their response. Some of them are Buddhists, yet they're consistently joining us for fellowship. We have done many activities with them, such as hiking, picnic, and weekly sport fellowship. Even though now we are in fellowship stage, but we truly want to believe God continue to touch their heart. Um, and we continue to practice our Shima statement and have that generally care for them. Our brothers and sisters did support some of their college events. They are touched by their presence and support. And we want to applaud young leaders that are willing to step back to make friends and have that genuine heart to care for their new friends, even though they should have holy day. We really thank God for our brothers and sisters for this outreach event. Even after one month after this IPG outreach, we do another outreach for main campuses, which are Unimas and UITM. I can sense a strong fire in their spirit to reach out to their friends. 80% are newbie for this vision. We believe that this is the fruits from the equipping since the pandemic. During the pandemic, we have only 20 plus people joining for our online service. Since April 2022, we opened up church for physical service and students can go back to their campuses. Our members grown to 40 plus. We aim for double this year. We continue, continuously amazed by the spirit of these young and vibrant, vibrant people of God. They consistently do Bible study in live group and in campuses and Bible marathon through Zoom to finish up reading their Bible. We pray that God continue to bring growth to our church and believe that Hope KS will become campus hub for young, fearing God generation. Thank you and God bless you. So outreach groups, it can come in all kinds of shapes and forms. 
you can have uh, gather people around some common interests, perhaps around sports, recreation, anything really. Some, some people we, in our church, we have had people who gather around over food, over gardening, over cooking, even over board games. Isn't that amazing? So you can also gather around common settings like your, your study place or your workplace. You can use any of those things. And so I want to encourage you, consider getting involved in some of these outreach groups. You can help make a difference in somebody else's life simply because you're willing to invest something in it. Think about this. Instead of just doing things you enjoy by yourself, would you consider doing it with others? So that it creates an opportunity for you and others to touch their lives. The third thing, the third insight I can see from this passage is that they were devoted to God's truth. In verse 42, again, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so what we have is the early church. They gathered around to discover God's word from the apostles. They, they were learning from the truth and it helped build them up to walk in God's ways. And that is why God's truth is so important, so essential in our uh, life groups. God's truth should be taught to strengthen the people's faith. It will disciple them, it will mature the people. So Bible discussions are, are always an important part of our life group meetings. It's, and it, it needs to be practical oriented so that not only do people learn and understand God's word, but they begin to con look into how can they apply God's word in their own life situations. So will you step out and be a student of God's word? Would you consider learning and, and becoming a teacher of God's word that you can help teach the, the parts of the Bible and I want to encourage you because you can grow in this and perhaps you can step out and help out in your life groups. Now, the outreach groups, they also need God's truth, but with a different focus. Think about that. You see, the truth is to help people encounter Jesus. It, the, this truth, it needs to be presented differently, in a different way. It needs to... Uh, point people towards Jesus. It's, it's probably not going to look like the kind of Bible discussions that you have in your typical life groups. But instead, it should be discussions around life and truth. We can be creative. We can be creative in turning the life matters, the issues of life, into doorways for God's truth. And in these outreach groups, God's truth can truly be revealed in such a way that's connected with their life and lead them to Jesus Christ. Now, the fourth key insight we gain from this scripture is that we see that people were awed by the Holy Spirit miracles. When we look in verse 43, it says, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. So there was great awe happening because of all these miracles, these incredible things were happening and it demonstrated the reality of God in their midst. And so even in the church and our life groups, the miraculous reinforces our faith because the reality of what we see in the scriptures, it now comes to pass in our very midst. It becomes real. So uh, the supernatural also helps us. It, it helps deals with issues that we normally cannot. Healing of people helps them in situations perhaps that modern medicine cannot help them. When you have uh, prophetic words, it can really encourage and strengthen the people by, by reviewing God's perspective into their life, their situations. You know, in the very early days of our church, Liling would used to have uh, dreams, prophetic dreams. And often it would relate with the people in our church. And, and God would show to her what is actually happening in their lives that nobody knows about, maybe even some secret things. And uh, some, some of our people would be really uh, nervous when Lighting says, oh, I just had a dream about you. you know? And it was something that God used that really uh, cause our people to walk, I guess, with a little bit more uh, fearfulness uh, before God. 
So it can help in tremendous ways when you have the supernatural things of God happening. Even in outreach groups, we find that the miraculous are powerful means for to bring evangelistic breakthroughs. When we look in the book of Acts, in chapter 5, we see in verse 12 to 16, it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on baits and mats so that at least Peter's shadow, wow, Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Imagine why the crowds were gathering also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. The Bible tells us. Isn't that amazing? You know, some church planting movements, they use these supernatural miracles as a mission strategy. See, what they do is they will have teams of people who would go from place to place, village to village, town to town, and they would ask around, is anybody sick? Is anybody needy? They need a miracle. And they would go and begin to pray for these ones, believing God to intervene. And when miracles or people are healed, when it begins to happen, people's hearts and uh, ears are beginning to open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through that, that's how they lead people to Christ. And once they've, they've led a few people to Christ, they launch a church over there. Isn't that amazing? What a powerful thing when that can happen. Some people have uh, arguments and perhaps even philosophies against the very existence of God. But when you have the miraculous signs of wonders happening right in front of them, all their arguments fall apart because no longer they, can they deny the existence of God because they've just experienced something miraculous of God. And that is why it is so important that we move in signs and wonders. Some years ago, some of our young people were out in the streets in the city of Brisbane. Uh, it was in the evening. And they were out there and they were trying to share the gospel to different people. And one time they came across this young girl and she was in crutches, an Australian girl. And they tried to approach her to share with her the gospel. And she was, she was like not interested. She was kind of a little bit rude to them. They said, no, 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 I'm not interested. Just, just get away, you know, leave me alone. And so they, they changed tack and, and they noticed because she was on crutches and, and her leg was in a, a, a cast sort of thing. And they said, can we pray for you? And I guess she wanted to get rid of them. She said, okay, just pray for me and then, then off you go. And they prayed for her. And a miracle happened. She got healed. And they said they, they, she was like, what? What just happened? And, 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 and she started walking around with her bad leg. And she suddenly said, I, I don't need my crutches. I, I can walk. And her eyes opened, her heart opened. She came to Christ that evening. Miracles can open the doors to people's hearts. And that is why we need the Holy Spirit working and bringing about tremendous miracles. And that is why we need to believe God that God can use us, especially beyond the walls of the church. God has called us to be a supernatural people, a people where signs and wonders will follow us, especially in times of outreach. In fact, when we look at the scriptures in Mark chapter 16, as part of Jesus' great commission to his disciples, he tied both together. Let's read Mark 16. In verse 15 to 18, it says, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. It goes on in verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. And it goes on, They will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. So we, we see Jesus tying the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, and the miraculous. And in the book of Acts, we, we see this again and again and again. The gospel spread powerfully because there were signs and wonders happening. The question is this, will you believe God that He can work signs and wonders and miracles because of you, through you, because you stepped out in faith and, and looked to God? So I want to encourage you, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Make sure you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let God open the door to the supernatural in your life. Step out in faith. Learn. Learn how you may operate in some of these supernatural gifts. And I believe every one of us, we can pray for the sick. And then we should believe for God's intervention. When the miracles begin to happen, wow, that will be incredible. Why not believe you can begin to operate in, in the prophetic? Maybe you can begin to exercise a word of knowledge or, or words of wisdom. God can use you. There's so many different aspects of the supernatural. Will you walk in some of them? Trust God. Ask God. Plead God that you may receive some of these things. Can somebody say amen? You know, perhaps you might be out playing badminton with a friend and he might stumble and fall and he sprains his ankle real bad. This is your opportunity to reach out in faith and cry out to God and pray for your friend's healing. Who knows? God may just intervene. A miracle might happen. It might just open your friend's heart to Jesus. Believe God. Trust Him for this. Now, the fifth insight I want to share with us is that these small groups can be built upon life-giving communities. In verse 42, in verse 46 and 7, uh, I'll read for you verse 46 and 7. It says, Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. So can you catch that impression? There's the buzz that's happening, the excitement, the joy. The community life was enriching. People were really happy. They were together. They were enjoying meeting with one another. They were enjoying being able to share and do life together. They were praising and seeking God together. That is the way it was meant to be in the church of Jesus Christ. So people really should feel better when they are in the church community. There should be that sense of security. There should be that sense of support. People should, build, should feel more built up in their hearts, in their faith. Uh, hope should really begin to flourish in their hearts. And, and that's why I love to hear testimonies. And we, have, we have many testimonies all the time where people are sharing testimonies to the church where they talk about their community, their life group, how the life group has been such an important part of their life, such an important part of their faith, such an important part of helping them encounter God. So our life groups should be developing a life-giving communities where our relationships are deepening, it's uh, enriched. And can I say, you are the key. Because as you contribute, as you step in, as you give of your own heart, as you seek to be a blessing to others, that's how you help to bring about an en enriching, life-giving community experience in your life groups. So I want to encourage you to step out and make it a reality. But also, when our people in life group, when, when they have experienced this uh, life-giving, enriching community, when they begin to go out uh, beyond the walls of the church, they begin to bring it with them. And so when we begin to form outreach groups, these outreach groups will begin to have such enriching, healthy relationships. It begins to uh, attract other people because there are many people who are looking around and, and, and they see. They see this and say, wow, I, I, I don't have this. I, 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 I miss this sort of things. I read an experience by this lady. In her younger days, she was a professor in the United States in the arts and literature. And she was a committed lesbian. In fact, she was an activist lesbian. And she would fight for the opportunities of the lesbians and, and all these uh, LGBT community groups and so forth. And, and one of the things she really was against was against the church because she really felt that the teachings of the church uh, really were against this LGBT groups of people and, and, and so she was seeking to write things to uh, demolish the uh, sort of philosophies that the church was promoting. And so one day, as she was seeking to do this, she received a letter from a pastor. Of course, the pastor was trying to say to her, you know, you wrote these certain things in, in your article and it's not correct because that's not what the Bible actually taught and so forth. And so the pastor offered her, says, 
why don't we have some discussions about the Bible? And this, this, late, this professor was thinking to himself, okay, why not? Because uh, I, I really need to know what they are saying so I can demolish all of it. So this pastor invited her to his home where his family uh, were and to join them. And so she, she came and she joined them for dinner. And, and one of the things that struck her is that how different, how different the family was to all her expectations. She began to, to see the sincerity, the, the love, the warmth that was in the family and, and how they, they would talk about God and the Bible as if it was true, as if God was real. And, and, and that struck something in her court and, and she, of course, had some more discussions with the pastor about his Bible and all this, but she kept coming back. She kept coming back because she was so drawn to the, the life that she saw in this family. And you know what? Eventually, she gave her heart to Jesus. She was safe because she was first attracted to the relationship that she saw. And eventually, she actually ended up marrying a pastor. What an amazing thing. And now she writes articles and books defending the Christian faith and talking about how amazing God is. All this comes down to the sort of community, a life-giving, a life-enriching community. And let me just say, the church will grow. The church will grow when there's healthy, when there's multiplying life groups, as well as outreach groups. And, and think about this, you see, these outreach groups could even be part of a life group's activity. The life group can extend itself to form outreach kind of groups. All this, this is possible. And when you have this, this life group that forms some of these outreach groups, you have a natural connection back to the life group. And when we do have all these groups, it's important. It's important, as we saw just now, we need to be strategic. We need to be intentional about why we have these groups so that it can reach out or, or build people in the right way. And such groups will thrive when you have the right kind of leadership. Uh, when it's based around God's truth, when you even have the miraculous happening in there, when there is a real depth of relationship that's building up so that it has that, that ingredients of a life-giving community. The question is, will you invest in such groups? Are you willing to participate and contribute of yourself to help build up the life groups in such a way that it can truly be the, what it's meant to be? Are you willing to invest yourself into some of this outreach group, invest of your creativity, invest of your heart that you may help reach out to people who do not yet know Jesus Christ? When we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, we begin to see much more of the supernatural, the miraculous happening in those groups. And you are the key. If you will step out and just trust God, believe Him that He can do amazing things because you step out, you listen to the uh, leading of the Holy Spirit and you obey Him. When we do this, the groups will grow. The groups will multiply. The church will grow. The kingdom of God will grow. And we will see transform lives everywhere. Shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, as we see this amazing example from Acts chapter 2. When we see this example of the early church, Father, we pray today, help, Lord, help it stir faith in our hearts. Father, we pray, may your Holy Spirit come upon us and speak to us. Father, we pray, help us, O oh Lord, to see the value of these small groups, of our live groups. They're so important because they are backbones of our churches. Father, we pray that our live groups will be healthy. Our live groups will be places of community. That our, our live groups, oh God, Lord, will have leadership. They will lead it spiritually. Lord, that, that we will truly see your word, your truth being being expounded and taught and learned and lived out in the midst of our life groups of God. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will also see the miraculous happening in each of every one of our life groups of God. Lord, that people will encounter the reality of heaven right where they are, oh God. Father, we pray. 
We pray, Lord, help our groups, oh God, to truly have that, that growth in the relationship. There will be an enriching experience. There will be life giving amongst the people as well, oh God. And Father, we pray. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that we will see innovative, creative uh, outreach groups, oh God, that begin to reach out and begin to break new ground. Lord, to touch different groups of people, whether it be in the places where they stay, whether it be their workplaces, Lord, whether it be uh, the, the outreach communities of, of recreation, Lord, or sports, or whatever common interests, oh Lord. Lord, Lord, we just pray, lead us in this. Help us, oh Lord, to, to be able to think creatively, Lord, how we can connect with people and Lord, begin to bring the truth of Jesus Christ to them. Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name. Because Lord, you, your spirit can lead us in this. Your, your spirit can anoint us in all these things. And we pray that even as we reach out, Father, we will see the miraculous, that we will see the power of God being revealed out there. Lord, help each one of us that we will be willing to step out and invest into these groups of God, that we will see these groups grow, multiply, and as a result, your kingdom grow as well. So Lord, we just commit this unto you. We pray for each and every one of us, O oh God. Speak to us, stir faith and courage in us, that we will see this, Lord, come to pass in our very midst. So Father, we thank you once again for all this. In Jesus, most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless every one of you. Amen.